Hey there! So, um, yesterday we had some tables dropped off in our um, spray tent, and one of them is going to be an indoor table, and one is going to be an outdoor table. Um, this slightly smaller one is going to be indoors. We're going to do a um, epoxy flood coat, uh, and we're very excited about that. We haven't done one quite this big, so and it's redwood, so we have a lot to talk about. Redwood is a very interesting wood to do um, flood coats over, so uh, what I want to do is um, talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, and then this one we're going to do a solvent urethane because it's outside. Now, the reason I mention that is because um, with solvent urethanes, uh, they have UV inhibitors and they can sit outside and not yellow. If we did an epoxy on this outside table, like we are on the inside table, then within six months, maybe even less, of hard sunshine, uh, the table would yellow and it could even crack and lose its integrity a little bit. So uh, something to keep in mind. So that's why we have two tables going on at the same time so that we can talk about the differences in the approaches and how you do it and also the importance of choosing the right finish. Okay, so these were just delivered. I haven't inspected them yet and I wanted to take you around and show you what I'm looking for and where I think the trouble spots will be. So this is a um, old growth redwood tree that came down and rather than you know not using it they went ahead and milled it into this very big chunk so um, it comes with all sorts of things that old trees come with okay in this case it's actually a big hole big holes here here splits more holes knots you want to make sure they don't go all the way through when you do a um, epoxy flood coat if you have a hole all the way through then you'll lose your epoxy out the hole. So you always want to check the other side and see if you see any light. More holes. Okay, lots of cracks. Let's take a look at the edge. Rough. Very rough. Rough saw marks. They left it on there probably for artistic reasons. It's fine. It makes it more challenging to seal. The end looks good. Got some open cracks. More open cracks. Take a look at this side. Rough cut again. Oh, and a whole mess of stuff. Okay. When doing epoxy, and you've got something like this, you're going to have to work a little bit extra hard. Um, the epoxy will not fill it in. It will tend to... Um, be a problem. So when we go and do our first initial coating, we're going to have to pay particular attention to these kinds of holes. Right there. So we've got a plan for those things. You don't want to come upon them as you're doing it. It's like a little bit of a cut, but nothing else. Okay, let's take a look at the end. More cracks and various things. Okay. So, um, the thing is, is that there's, there's nothing wrong with having these holes. You just have to plan for them. What you want to do is pre-fill them. So, um, when you have redwood and you're doing epoxy on uh, any wood, really, but especially redwood, because it's so porous, um, you have got to do uh, a, a coat of epoxy before your flood coat. And there's, there's lots of reasons for it. Okay, one... Um, the most important is air bubbles, because if you just do a flood coat over this, the, the air that's trapped inside the grain will release thousands of bubbles, and you will not be able to pop them. It's not like you're doing it over, um, you know, some sort of like, you know, masonite or something, or a, a countertop that's, you know, made from, from mica. No, this is a totally different game. When, with redwood, it's just, it's basically so much air sitting in there. It just can't wait to release it. And when you put an epoxy down, it's like, hey, and, and it, it's like nothing I've ever seen. I mean, the very first time I did a flood coat over, um, just did a little sample just to see what would happen. <laughs> I was popping bubbles for hours and I, I never got them all. Okay. So you have to hand brush or roll uh, your first coat down have to. Don't have to make it thick, but it's got to be a complete seal. 
if you do not do a complete seal, wherever you haven't sealed, the bubbles will come up. Now, once you've sealed it, the air is trapped and you do not have to take an air tool or a pro, uh, propane torch and torch the seal coat. It, just leave it as it is. It's going to do its job, which is just, it's going to be that first coat down. Now, we just did our inspection, right? Lots of little holes and cracks. You want to do your best to, to fill those. So in addition to doing your flood coat, putting some extra in those holes and bringing them up to the level would be a little handy. And you don't have to do them all the way, but just make sure that you've really thoroughly coated on the inside of them. You don't want air to find its way out. Now, when you do your flood coat, it will tend to fill. So let's say I've got like a quarter inch here. You know, you don't have to fill it a quarter inch on that first, you know, hand brush coat. But just make really good and sure you've got it completely covered. This knot, same thing. You want to make sure that you've got it going down in there and that there's a complete coverage. You don't want it to go in and just coat one side of the crack and not the other. Because then that's going to release air out of that crack. So you've got to make darn good and sure that you have, especially on the cracks, sealed them. Okay? So... Um, the temperature's wrong today. The thing about epoxy is it, it really needs to be 70 degrees uh, or more for, you know, the whole time that it's curing. And today, um, we're too hot. Okay. Tomorrow we're supposed to get a break. So we're going to do it tomorrow. So I'm going to prep this table and I'll do it in fast motion so I don't bore you. But I do want to, um, I do want you to see some of the things that you will want to do. Okay. One being you want to get the table off the ground. Because when you do a flood coat, the epoxy flows down um, over the side and it drips onto the floor. So, you know, unless you have a perfectly, you know, uh, nice level floor, it tends to, you know, pool and it may very well pool uh, onto the legs uh, of your table and you may glue your, your table to the ground. I've seen it. I've almost done it. <laughs> so I'm warning you. The other thing is you want to put blocks under your table and you want to level it. Because when you're pouring a flood coat on it, if it's in an angle, this side's going to get more epoxy than this side. So get your level out, level it, and make sure that it's not only level in one direction, but the other direction, okay? And uh, block it up, and um, feel free to get the thickest uh, plastic you can on the ground to make sure that when it catches it, uh, it catches it. One time I used a cheap plastic from the dollar store just because I was in that kind of mood. And it leaked through, and it attached itself to my floor. Yes, so clever. Not. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to set the camera up. You can watch me go to work. Let me show you something. I like to use these soft bristle brushes to clean out the cracks, the holes, anything else that might be in there. Just kind of work my way down the table. And then when I'm done, um, I clean it off as best I can. And then just before I epoxy, I'll go over it with the uh, tack cloth. Um, I've never found the tack cloth to leave any kind of problems. Uh, as far as residue that will affect the epoxy. However, with an open grain like this and holes, you will want to make sure that the tack cloth 
doesn't leave any strands that get caught in the knot. So that is one thing you'll want to look out for. So I want to talk to you for a minute about the glitter we're going to be using, okay? Um, I'm using glitter from uh, BulkGlitters.com and it's called Apollo's Chariot, okay? It is a clear uh, glitter that has a iridescent shine over the top of it. Now the iridescent shine is gold. It's a very light gold. Okay, so why did we choose this one? Redwood's classy stuff. Um, it has been growing for hundreds of years. Uh, you know, you could certainly put like a bling gold or a silver over it, but you know, it just needs more class, okay? And there's something wrong with gold and silver in the right context, but old growth redwood? Okay, so the client really wanted to have something subtle and elegant. And what's going to happen is you are not really going to see this. It's going to be sitting in the urethane. It's going to be sitting in the epoxy. And only when the light hits it will it just like give off this light gold. It should be really, really beautiful. Uh, I did a sample and it was just spectacular. Uh, so, you know, choosing the right glitter for the job. All right. Um, this Apollo's Chariot, the iridescent, is solvent resistant. That is super important. You do not want to be doing this beautiful project and spending hundreds of dollars on uh, urethanes and epoxies and then you get a craft glitter that melts and, and bleeds all over the place. So please always look at the properties of your glitter. Um, look at the charts. We provide the information. If you don't know what you're doing, contact us. We will tell you. Um, and another note, did you, can you hear the bug flying around? There's a bee. Um, the day before or the night before, if you're doing this in your garage or you're doing it in a tent or you're doing it in an outbuilding, um, do everything you can to get all the bugs out and seal it up. Like uh, as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to get that bee out of here and everything else that's out of here. I'm going to seal this up uh, so that when I come in tomorrow morning, no bugs. Um, there's nothing worse than doing a beautiful epoxy job and you come in and there's bugs all over it and they are attracted to it. So take the bugs seriously. Okay, so uh, about ready to start the second table. The second table is going to be done with a flood coat of epoxy. This is the brand I like to use. They're excellent. So uh, follow the manufacturer's directions. Uh, you should be using it between 70 and 80 degrees, uh, no more than 50% humidity, and they really mean it. I've done it in uh, conditions other than that, and it really doesn't work as well. Um, we're going to, it's the redwood tables, right? Tons and tons of air inside redwood, especially dry, super dry, old growth redwood like we have here. So they recommend doing two and even three seal coats, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. You have to do them five hours apart, at least. So I'm going to do my first one this morning, my second one tonight, and then tomorrow morning um, I'll come in and use a little uh, rubbing alcohol over the top of it, uh, and then at that point do my third one. Okay, so I'm not going to show you the mixing process because you should be following the manufacturer's directions and not what I'm doing. Here we go. Um, I'm going to be spreading the epoxy with this clear plastic. It's got a little bit of flexibility and I'm just going to do a thin coat over the top.
Okay, so tonight we'll be doing uh, a second coat, seal coat, and then um, when we go and do the glitter, we'll be the final flood coat. It works better that way because otherwise, if you're brushing or you are using that plastic card you saw me, you'll just drag the glitter right off. So it's going to happen in um, the flood coat. Okay. Okay, so this is what the table looks like with two coatings. I'm going to get close because our, this is really important, all right? So I'm going to do the best I can to hold a focus here. Um, see how shiny this is right here, um, right here in this area? Okay. That means it's ready for flood coating. Okay. When you see areas like here, see how it's not as glossy? That right there should be as glossy as that right there before you flood coat. Why? Because this means bubbles could still come out of your, your grain. It's, it's not shiny enough. So what this table needs is a third uh, seal coat. Okay? Because you want to make sure that it's consistently glossy. See? Gloss here, not here. This right here is ready to just put air right back into your epoxy, and uh, that could be just a nightmare for you. So here, again, gloss, not as glossy. You know, everything's glossy, but it's not as glossy. Here, gloss, less gloss, right? So we're going to shoot for all gloss like this. So one more seal coat, and uh, we're going to be good to flood. Okay, I'm busy mixing my busy mixing it up here. Got my A in there, got my B in there, got my glitter in there. And uh, I'm just going through the mixing process. sign that it's not pouring off left, right, and all over the place. That means my table's nice and level. That gives me a little bit of extra time to play. It's a lot easier to spread it when it doesn't really want to run off. If you've got it at an angle and you find it's running off, you have to work really fast to try and smooth it out. If you miscalculated and you didn't get enough, um, you should have your helper. And if this is your first time, you should always have a helper. But you would have your helper make a second batch. And you do not really want to wait very long for that second batch. You want to have your helper see the situation and start that next batch for you if it looks like you don't have enough. This is a self-leveling epoxy, within reason, uh, so it tends to level itself out. So the squeegee is just encouraging it to find its level. The process that you see me doing now probably have to do it several times. It's, you have to be very patient with this sort of thing. Um, the, the dripping will continue, but you want to just come in uh, maybe 20 minutes, kind of, you know, go over the sides again, uh, have to pop the bubbles a couple times, 
And then once you've kind of gotten it to that 30 minute stage, you kind of just need to leave it alone. I'm gonna give you a tip here. Um, epoxy is so glossy, sometimes you can be blinded by the overall effect. And you won't even notice that there's like a little spot, maybe in a half inch or something, it just has no epoxy. So it's always important to get down and take a look at it from several angles to see if you see any of those open spots. It's, it's shocking. <laughs> You'll be like, oh, it's all great. And then all of a sudden you look at a different angle and there's an open spot. So please take a look from at least four angles to see if you have any open spots. Now is the time to do it. It's easy to solve it now. All you have to do is move it around a little bit and you're, and you're fixed. The only one I see is that knot, and that's never going to fill. And also look at your edge. You want to make sure that it's coming over like Niagara Falls. You want to make sure it's coming over so that you get that nice, clean edge. Okay, it's bubble popping time. This is when I'll do my first bubble popping round. I'll do at least two, maybe three. Now, the thing about bubble popping is this is not about the heat from the heat gun. It's about carbon dioxide, so you can blow on it yourself, although I don't recommend breathing and blowing in this environment, um, but you can. Two, you can use a hairdryer. Three, heat gun. Four, um, propane torch. I like to use uh, an electric gun. That's just what I'm used to. Sometimes the bubble popping can kind of feel like whack-a-mole, <laughs> especially when you have knots. Just stay patient, um, keep at it. You know, this is one of those things where it's worth um, taking your time with. Um, and sometimes give it a few minutes rather than going right at it. Let them come on up and then go at them again. Otherwise, you'll just stand there doing it for like 20 minutes, which is fine if you feel like it. But otherwise, you know, it's better to just kind of let them come up and then deal with them. If you're in a, a garage or like an outdoor environment, um, keep it sealed. Bugs love this. You hear me talking about bugs a lot if you watch my videos. It's for a reason. They're like ridiculous. They'll find your piece and flop down on it just because. So um, keep it sealed. Trust me. Bugs are no fun. Okay, after much popping, they have subsided. The only um, spots on the table at this point are knot holes, which are not going to fill. And it is a beautiful thing to behold. Let's see if I can get down at the angle where you can see. Okay, so now it's time to seal up the tent, walk away, maybe check on it in 10 minutes just to make darn good and sure no other bubbles, you know, pop up. Okay, so the epoxy table is done. It's dry. It's beautiful. Um, love it. And there's just one last step, and that is taking off the drips. So I want to show you what I'm talking about. These drips right here. Um, you know, if you're one of these people who wants to check on the table every 20 minutes, you can take a brush and generally get those drips reduced. But quite honestly, unless you're willing to really sit there, um, you're, they're going to form. It's just part of the, the world of epoxy. So I like to take either a belt sander or a pad sander to it. Um, belt sander goes a little bit faster. I like it. and that, But the pad sander is certainly uh, sufficient if the drips aren't super big. So uh, there you go. going to take those little puppies off and then uh, we'll do the final reveal.